Well, grace and peace to everyone. It's good to be here. We're going to be going through the book of Romans, and some of you might wonder why it was that I chose Romans as the very first book to go through as followers of the way. And I want to give a little bit of, of background on that question, and we're going to spend actually quite a bit of time talking about some technical questions that I hope will be edifying to you. Before we even get into Romans, turn with me in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 16 down through chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 down through chapter 4, verse 4. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Conv convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The reason I want to begin with this passage is to stress the importance of at least a significant amount, if not the majority of preaching, I believe should be what we often call expository preaching. Now look carefully with me at what we just read. He says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. He's saying the Bible has tremendous value. And it can complete us. It will equip us for every good work. But often we don't read the first verse of chapter 4, which is in continuity with the previous verse. So what is the conclusion? He says, I charge you therefore, and notice how strong this charge is. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom. That's a pretty strong preamble. He's charging us before God and Jesus, who will judge all of us. And what does he say? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And he explains that there will come a time when people will not want to go through the word. I'm not saying it's wrong to preach topically. I have done that many times, and I, I will continue to do so from time to time. But the staple, I believe, of our diet as Christians should be expository preaching as we work through the word of God. Because of all the reasons that were given there in that chapter in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now I want to just give you a short example. This is somewhat obscure, but I think you'll find it hopefully helpful. Turn as well to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, it gives us an example of what this looks like. It gives us an example of going through the word, preaching the word, Nehemiah chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. Notice that posture, it's very interesting. Verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. 
And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hadiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, help the people to understand the law while the people remain in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. You see that? So this is how people used to read the Bible. Someone would stand up and read it, and there was this, I think, fairly impressive scene. People would stand up, they would lift their hands, they would bless God. They would say, Amen, Amen. They would read from the book, and what does it say in verse 8? They helped the people to understand the law. There was some kind of explanation given. And then in verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense. So they didn't just read it and sit down. They made sure that people understood it. They explained it so that people understood the reading. This is a beautiful picture of what our lives should be as we exposit the word of God. This is exactly, I'm convinced, what Paul is referring to in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so that's what we're going to do. Jesus actually does something very similar at the start of his ministry. If you remember in Luke chapter 4, someone reads from Isaiah, and he explains that. I'll give you a couple of other reasons why we should strongly favor expository preaching. I hope you all know the difference between expository and topical. Expository means you just go through the Bible systematically as it's laid out, and you explain it. Topical means you just you choose a topic. I'm going to talk about marriage, and you choose all the verses about marriage. Or I'm going to talk about humility, and you choose a bunch of verses about humility. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but we're lacking something if we fail to exposit the Word of God. You know, Jesus said in the Great Commission, he said that we're supposed to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey everything that he commanded. How can we do that if we're not going through everything in the Bible? So this is very important. You know, we, we have to learn the Bible well. We have to have a God-centered preaching, and in particular, learn to not take things out of context. Often I have found that when you have topical preaching too much, you get the same thing again and again, and you're basically hearing the pet peeves and the, the, the preferences and what the preacher happens to be stuck on. You're not actually shaped by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. So we're going to be spending quite a long period of time going through the book of Romans. Romans is, without doubt, the most influential letter ever written. Nothing else is even close. Now, most of us who were raised in a Protestant evangelical setting have had heavy instruction from this book. We've learned a lot from this book. When I was in college, I remember someone telling me, oh, if you want to lead someone to God, take them down the Romans road. You know how many of you have heard that? The Romans road. There are these verses in Romans. You start with all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you say, for the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. And Christ Jesus our Lord. And whoever confesses with his mouth, Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead. There's a set of verses you're supposed to take people through. And as we're going to see, uh, there's some truth in that, but I think we can improve on that quite a bit. Now, the book of Romans is also important because it has dramatically affected some of the most important people in history, in, in the history of the church. So, if you have read any church history, you will know that... <coughs> Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you pronounce his name, Romans was his book. It was the book that really shaped his whole life. And he writes about this quite extensively in his own writings. It very much was at the center, the absolute center of Martin Luther's life. Martin Luther, of course, kick-started the whole Reformation. And Romans was at the core of a reshaping of his own idea of God and salvation. Calvin, John Wesley reports the same thing. I'll read you, though, a quote that I think is very insightful. It is common to list saints and Christians who have been radically changed by reading this letter. It is common to list saints and Christians who have been radically changed by reading this letter. The catalog could be balanced by a similar number who have radically misunderstood it. Troublingly, the lists overlap. 
So he says, there's one list of people over here that have been radically changed by reading a letter, the letter of Romans. There's another list over here of people who have radically misunderstood it. The lists overlap. One of the things that happens very early on with Augustine in the 4th century is he proposes very much what we might call a psychological reading of Romans. And in particular, he proposes a psychological reading of Romans 7. So Augustine is often called the first modern human being because he's highly uh, introspective, he's highly psychological in ways that no one before him ever really was and no one ever had, had ever at least written about. And Augustine, he proposed that Romans 7, the very famous chapter where Paul, Paul writes about he wants to do something good, but he can't do it, and what he wants to do, he doesn't do, what he doesn't want to do, he does. He proposes that this is the, the plight, the nature of himself and all other people. And, uh, and this, is, this is a reading that will persist. Now, what, what's fascinating, Luther has the same mentality. Luther comes to Romans, and he sees Romans as his way to <coughs> escape the guilt that he is feeling. He's under a tremendous burden of guilt, and he sees Romans as the key to escape the guilt, this guilty conscience that he feels. Now, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history here that some of you at least will find interesting. I think it's very interesting. The book of Romans is, is a book that, as we look at if we can call it the, the Protestant side of the world, and then maybe the, the kingdom or Anabaptist side of the world, there's been a different response. So typically, the, the Anabaptist or the kingdom side, they gravitate towards books like, book like uh, Matthew or James or those kinds of books. And then you have the Protestant side, they love Paul and Romans. And it's very interesting to see the different books that the different sides have gravitated toward. Now I'm going to propose, and hopefully this will become clear as the series evolves, that in fact, we should be as excited about the book of Romans as the Protestant evangelicals are. Because the book has actually been misread by Protestant evangelicals, and when it's rightly read, it fits beautifully, absolutely beautifully, into a kingdom lens, into a kingdom framework. And I'm confident you all understand this. Now, what's interesting is that in the last 50 years or so, many people have been rereading Romans, not kingdom people or Anabaptists, but I would say the, the generally smart Protestant evangelical, and they actually have been changing their reading and moving more towards our way. So I'll, I'm going to just give you a little bit of information about this because I think it is important. So in 1963, there was a very famous writer who was a professor at Harvard, just a few miles from us here. His name was Christopher Stendhal. And he was reading Paul, and he wrote a paper called Paul and the Introspective Conscience of the West. And it's an interesting title. He basically proposed that in the West, people had misread Paul and taken him as being this, this very psychological writer who deals with the problems of the conscience. And Stendhal proposes that that's actually a complete misreading of Paul, who's actually much more outwardly focused about the community of the church. Okay, so that was kind of a, a, an important first salvo. This paper caused shockwaves in the academic community. It's still discussed today. I've, I've read it. It's on my, my computer. If you want to read it, I'll share it with you. Then another big event happened in the 1970s. A person who's a fairly liberal Protestant writer, he wrote a book. His name is E.P. Sanders. The book is called Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Paul and Palestinian Judaism. So you might say, what, what's so big a deal about this? Well, this is very important. So what, what Sanders proposed is he proposed that, in fact, the whole way that Protestants had read Romans was actually set by an understanding of Judaism. Okay, so let me explain what I mean here. The basic thesis that Sanders laid out was that Judaism was mischaracterized, and in particular, the way that most people read Romans, they think about it like this. And I'm guessing most of you probably have this understanding. We're going to try to set this all straight. But most of you 
probably when you think of the Jews, you probably think of it's a group of people that are guilty of works righteousness. They're trying to earn their way to heaven. And the more and more good works they do, the more favor they get with God, the, the more they struggle, the more they strive, the more meritorious they believe they are. And Paul, in Romans, in this, what I'll argue is a misreading, he says, no, no, those Jews are wrong. You don't get to God by good works. You get to God by salvation through faith alone. This is how most people have read Romans. There's a foil. There's, a, there's an opponent kind of hidden in the background, which is this Judaism understanding, which is, like I said, this good works understanding. Now, what Sanders and many people have done since then is they actually went back and, and tried to read and understand, well, what did Jews actually understand about their own salvation? And lo and behold, it's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. In fact, the whole thing is a complete farce. And very few people who are serious writers or readers would, would actually give any credence to that, that picture. It's in fact, a terrible caricature. In fact, Jews didn't believe anything like that. They believed that they were saved by virtue of being members of this ethnic group of Israel. And their sins were taken away at Yom Kippur every year when the high priest did this whole ceremony and put the blood on the, on the altar. And that was what took away their sins. It wasn't any kind of a works righteousness that was underlying it. Sanders and others actually went on, many others went on, to say that this, in fact, laid the ground for a lot of anti-Semitism that has been present in Protestant circles for centuries. And that one of the reasons that Jews have been persecuted is that they've been greatly misunderstood. So I'll, I'll tantalize you with with a question. I'm not going to answer it today. We'll answer it in the coming weeks. What is the real foil? What is the real opponent that Paul is dealing with in Romans? It's not this Jewish works righteousness idea. It's something else entirely. Be thinking about that at least. Okay, so we need to understand this book. This is a very important book. This has shaped millions of people. We need to master this book. It is a battleground book. Like I said, now many very good People, very uh, sharp scholars, are moving in our direction. But I would say that the average kingdom Christian, the average Anabaptist, the average person who's sympathetic with non-resistance and these views, has no idea about any of this. They really don't know how to read Romans in the light of the things that we've been talking about. But I'm going to go through all of that. Okay, so what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about the background to the letter. So background is very important. You know, this is something that I know many of you have heard me stress many times. You can't understand something properly if you don't know the context. Many of you have gone through the quiz, our famous quiz, where we have asked people if they know the Bible. I've given this many times in many places. And, uh, and I'm convinced that most people, they treat the Bible basically as a grab bag of verses. And... They just, oh, this sounds nice. I'm going to grab this one. Now I'm going to grab this one. Now I'm going to grab that one. And they grab these verses completely shoddily with very little respect for the underlying context. And it turns into an utter disaster. I used to teach a year-long Old Testament class. And I said this many times, that if you don't understand 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25, you can't understand the Old Testament. If you don't know who... In particular, Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah are. If you don't know those, those stories really well, you're going to be lost when you understand the Old Testament, particularly the second half of the Old Testament. Most people who have been born and raised in the church, if you ask them, just give me an outline of, again, some of these fundamental questions. Tell me about what is Haggai about. Give me one, one line, one minute about the book of Haggai. They'll look at you and say, I know it's in the Bible, but I have no idea what it's about. Or give me a little bit about what happened with who led the returns back from the Babylonian exile. They'll, they'll say, I have no idea. There are four people. Hopefully, many of you can quickly name them. If you can't, you, you're in this category that needs to do a lot of study. Uh, in this Old Testament class, we would do a big chart and go through the kings and the prophets and put them all together. It's very important. The same situation exists in the New Testament. If you don't understand especially the second half of the book of Acts, 
then you can't understand a lot of the epistles and you will be a very impoverished reader. We did a, years ago, we did a year-long <laughs> preaching series through the whole book of Acts and I would go through and get a map and have everybody say what happened here, what happened there, what happened in Galatia versus Ephesus versus Philippi, what made the, the letters so different there. you got to be able to do that. If you can't do that and you're an adult or near an adult, then you need to go back and study. Now you might say, is this Bible trivia? Is this just snobbery? Why does this matter? Well, let me apply this to a human relationship. Let's apply this to my wife. Let's say somebody came up to me and said, uh, Laura, where did she grow up? And I said, hmm, not too sure about that. How many siblings does she have? Can't really tell you exactly. What's her favorite food? Favorite food? Why are you asking me all these questions? This is just trivia. I don't you know I have a relationship with her? And that's what matters. I have a relationship with her. Can't you see that I have a, a, a great, godly relationship? And people would look at you and say, you have a very weird relationship with your wife. That you don't know these basic facts about her life. This is exactly analogous to Scripture. We're supposed to have a relationship with God to Jesus to his word, and if we don't know these basic details, my contention is that we have a farce. The heir of Marcion. How many people knew who Marcion is? A couple people. So Marcion was a person who, he didn't like all of the specific stories about the Bible. He just liked the Proverbs and the nice sayings, and he tried to cut out, especially a lot of the Old Testament. The heir of Marcion is alive and well. He tried to make Christianity a generic religion. And unfortunately, in many ways, he succeeded. The same impulse drove the formation of the Unitarians and the Universalists, who detached themselves from the basic narrative of the story of the Bible. Specific revelation all too often goes by the wayside. Okay, so now let's go key in on Romans and let's ask some questions. What's the context? So Rome, the city of Rome, which is in Italy, is, was the largest city of the entire Roman Empire. The population of Rome was estimated to be between half a million and a million people. A lot of people will say a million, but somewhere in that range, half a million to a million people. We know from a writer named Ambrosiaster that the church there began in the time of Pentecost. So we know from the book of Acts that people came from all over the empire to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost, for Passover and Pentecost. And it says that people there, 3,000 people, came to know the Lord and many of them went back. When they went back, the gospel naturally traveled to all these different places where they were from. And so a church began, according to Ambrosia Esther, right after Pentecost in AD 33. Okay, so this means that this church was not founded by Paul. This was not founded by Paul. This is very different than Galatians, than Ephesians, than Corinthians, all those other churches. He founded them. When he writes to Rome, he's writing a little bit like a stranger, someone who doesn't know the people there. It's a new environment for him. He can't claim any kind of foundational importance to this group of people there. This is a very important piece. Okay, now to whom is the letter written within Corinth? We're going to talk a lot about this in the coming weeks. For now, let's just leave it at, the, this is written to primarily to Gentile Christians. And I'm just going to read to you two verses to prove this to you. And we're going to spend a lot of time on this later on. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 13, it says, now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So Paul is writing to Romans chapter 1, verse 13, and he's saying, you're Gentiles, you're, you're not Jewish people. So that's how he's writing to them. And he says the same thing in Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. Okay. So he's writing to, primarily, a Gentile group of Christians. Now, we won't do this now, but in Romans chapter 16, he greets 
the Christians there in Rome, and he says, the church that meets in such and such a person's house. And if you count it out, you'll find that there are about five house churches that are named. There's a, a very well-known scholar, some would say the leading scholar of Paul's name is N.T. Wright. He, he estimates that there are around 100 Christians. And you can do this in a variety of ways. You can count names. You can. There, there's several ways, and I've actually done quite a bit of study on this. But I think ballpark, that's a safe assumption. There's about 100 people in Rome that he is writing to. Now, that might surprise you. I don't know if that surprises you, but it did surprise me. I, I used to have this picture of, like, these huge numbers of people there and 100 people. I mean, if you take our little group here, you know, we're not too far away from the size of the Roman church there. So if you... Count that out. That is, if you divide that into the population, that's 0.02% of the population. Christians were a very, very small percentage of the population at Rome. Very small. And keep in mind that they had been around, as we'll see, for over 20 years. So they weren't a huge group. We're going to see in a little bit, this, this uh, was written in AD 57, so they've been around for about 24 years, so it's a tiny, tiny group of people. Okay, another very important detail, so you got to turn with me to Acts chapter 18 to understand this detail. So Acts chapter 18, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. This is an extremely important contextual note that we need to remember as we begin Romans. So it says this, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. Okay, so I hope you caught that. So Paul goes from Athens, Athens is in Greece, he goes a little bit south to Corinth, and he says he finds a Jew there named Aquila with his wife, with his wife Priscilla. But why are they there? There's a very important little parenthetical detail there. It says because Claudius, Claudius was the emperor of Rome, had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. The Jews were, were kicked out of Rome. You all see that? Very important detail. This is actually, for those who like apologetics, this is a great example of this. There's actually a secular uh, writer, a secular pagan Roman writer, who, this was discovered much, much later, who actually documents this exact same event. The writer's name is Suetonius, and he says, quote, Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome because they were constantly rioting at the instigation of Crestus. So Crestus, it's very interesting. So the secular writer, pagan writer, says that that Claudius the emperor kicked the Jews out of Rome because they were making trouble at the instigation of Crestus. So Crestus sounds a lot like Christos, which is Christ. And so almost certainly this is the same episode that we have recorded in secular history. The Jews were kicked out of Rome, and maybe this was due to tension between the Jewish Christians and the, the non-Jewish Christians. We don't exactly know. But we know from other estimates that the, 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 the regular Jews were about 5 to 10% of the Roman population, and they were kicked out of Jews. So the Christian percentage was very small, but the Jews as a whole were kicked out. Now, you can figure this out based on when Claudius was emperor. This happened in AD 49. So try to remember these dates. So AD 49, they were kicked out of, of Rome. Now, this is all just from secular history. I told you that the church started in 8033. In 49, the Jews are kicked out of Rome. That's described in Acts, as well as from this secular writer. Well then, in 8054, Claudius dies. And guess what? After he dies, the Jews move back to Rome. They were kicked out by him, and now he's dead, so they move back to Rome. Okay. Now, why is this important? Imagine that you were a Gentile Christian living in Rome. <coughs> You're a Gentile Christian, and you have now seen all the, this rioting and all this trouble. The Jews were kicked out, AD 49, they're gone. And I told you Claudius died in AD 54, that's five years. 
and now they come back. There would almost certainly be some tension and some awkwardness and some questions between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. They're back again. They haven't been with each other for five years. I don't know if you've ever been in situations where there's been kind of an awkward parting and all of a sudden the person's back in your life again and think, oh, okay, now i got to figure this all out. How's this going to work? It was awkward. Very easy to understand. Jew-Gentile relationships are strained. This is going to make sense out of a lot of the passages of Romans. A tremendous amount of the book of Romans is about relationships between Jews and Gentiles. These two groups of people that were split apart for a while and now are back together again. Okay, so this right alone, right, right here, this corrects a lot of the skew that people have when they read Romans. You know, if you come to Romans and you think, okay, this is going to be, Paul wrote this letter to tell me how to be free of a guilty conscience. Well, I think you can probably infer indirectly some of that from Romans, but that's not really the main point of why he's writing the book of Romans. He's not writing it to lay out some plan of salvation. He's writing it to restore damaged relationships between Jews and Gentiles. So it's, it's less about an inward psychological individual focus and more about an outward corporate transformational dimension. In fact, I'll use the technical term here, Romans is more about ecclesiology than it is about soteriology. Ecclesiology simply means the study of the church. Soteriology is the study of salvation. Romans is much more about the nature of the church, the nature of community, than it is about personal salvation. The context definitely suggests that. Okay, so Claudius dies in AD 54, this, this Roman emperor. Well, guess who takes over as the next emperor? He was young at the time. His name was Nero. Nero becomes the next emperor after Claudius. Now, Paul writes the book of Romans in AD 57, so just three years after Claudius has died. And this is before Nero has gone crazy. Most of us know the name Nero because he was one of the most wicked, vile leaders of all time. He was a, a horrible person who is famous as being one of the most wicked emperors of all time. Uh, he, he goes crazy and he starts to become, his, his uh, heinousness becomes evident in AD 59 when Nero kills his mother. And after Nero kills his mother, he, he goes on this rampage, kills lots of people, eventually he persecutes the church very viciously. But Paul's writing in AD 57, before it's obvious that Nero is this terribly wicked emperor. Now, just again, hold this in your mind, because there's going to be a very famous chapter, some of you know this chapter, Romans 13, where Paul talks about how those in government, those who are ministers, have been given the sword by God himself. And ironically, Paul is writing this in AD 57, when none other than Nero is holding the sword, and Nero is going to be the man who actually kills Paul by ordering his decapitation. So ironically, Paul, when he writes Romans 13, and he says the, the, the government, the ministers, have been instituted by God, is saying that Nero was instituted by God, and the very sword that he says has been given to the government by God will be the very sword that cuts off his own head. Fascinating. Nobody disagrees about this, by the way. You will not find any commentary. You can look anywhere you want. They will all agree on this. Nero was emperor, and, and Paul is writing uh, during this time period where uh, the early days of Nero there. Okay, very important for context. Okay, so now, next point. Where is Paul writing here? I won't have you turn to this, but he actually tells us explicitly this in Romans chapter 16. He's saying, he says this, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasure of the city, greets you, and Quartus, a brother. So you can look up these names, but these people were in Corinth. I've actually been to Corinth, my wife and I have been to Corinth, and that inscription of Erastus, the city treasurer, is still there. You can go and see it with your own eyes. So it says that Paul is in Corinth, writing from this, this person, uh, Gaius's house. And interestingly, it says that in in Romans 16, verse 23, that the whole church in Corinth fit in one person's house. 
It's pretty interesting. So again, even the Pauline churches that he founded were not very large. They were small. I think this says a lot about the narrow road. And we, we often have wrong-headed ideas that there were like thousands and thousands of people that were tiny. We were like dozens of people were actually uh, true Christians. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Paul's purpose. I think it's safe to say that the main purpose that he writes the letter is to repair these Jew-Gentile fractured relationships, these tensions between the Jews and the Gentiles on one side. But there's a secondary purpose, which this one I would like you to turn to. So turn to Romans chapter 15, and let's look at verses 22 to 25. Romans chapter 15, verses 22 to 25. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey, and be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Okay, so he says here, he's in Corinth, remember, he's writing from Corinth to Rome, AD 57. He's saying, I've got to go to Jerusalem, and there's a very famous collection that he takes. The church in Jerusalem is suffering from a famine, and he's collected money from the churches in Macedonia. And he's going to deliver those funds to help the, the hungry people, the people suffering from famine in Jerusalem. And then he wants to go from Jerusalem to Rome, and then from Rome to Spain. He says that while he is in Rome, he wants to be refreshed. He wants to get to know them. He wants to be helped by them while he's stopping over on his way to Spain. So toward that goal, okay, so this is goal number two. Goal number one is to heal Jew-Gentile relationships. Goal two is he needs to stop there as a, as a way to, to be helped, to be refreshed, to build relationships, maybe even receive support to go to Spain so he can start new churches there. But there's a little bit of a challenge, which is that Paul is a controversial figure. He is, in the book of Acts, we know that he is widely regarded as being anti-Torah. He has this reputation of not liking circumcision, he has this reputation of speaking against Moses, at least that's how it's perceived. And so he needs to introduce himself to this group and establish himself. Remember, he didn't start that church. These are, these are new people for him. And so he has to establish his own position. So this is the third idea of Romans, is that he needs to establish his own doctrinal position that's, that's balanced. He's neither anti-Torah, uh, but, but neither is he arguing that Gentiles are bound by the Old Covenant as well. Now, this Jew-Gentile discussion puzzles many people. It befuddles many people. Uh, I, I, I wish we could, we could talk about this now, but we won't in the interest of time. Very few people today correctly understand, biblically, how we should think about Jews and Gentiles and all those questions. It is amazing how much confusion there is about that. I can tell you many examples of conversations that I've had where people don't understand what about Israel, what about the Jews, what about what about all these things? How do we think about this? Paul is going to lay all of this out. Now, we live in a time of great, great confusion about this. I have been to places where I, I think this happened before I was married. I've been to places where they they will uh, Christian churches will they will blow a shofar and people will eat kosher and they won't have any pork and I mean it's just people get so into that and they think like oh yeah this the Old Testament that's for us and I've been to other places at the complete opposite extreme. This is a big problem that we're going to have to to deal with. Okay. A little bit more about this. Uh, Romans is a letter. It is not a systematic theology. You know, we, it would be nice, and I think a lot of people treat Romans as if it's almost like a textbook. It's something that Paul has written for, for us as like a systematic theology textbook. That's, that's very unfair. That's not, 
the purpose of it. It's a letter. And in fact, there's very little in the book of Romans about Christology. There's very little about the nature of Jesus in the book of Romans. There's a lot in other books like Colossians and Philippians. Interestingly, there's very little in the book of Romans about the second coming. Almost nothing is there about that. That, that used to bother me. I don't know about you, but it used to bother me. I, I like math. I like science. I like very systematic things that lay everything out in a very elegant, simple way. There's nothing really like that in the epistles. They're what are often called occasional letters. Now, there are other letters that are a little bit more general. But an occasional letter means that the letter is written for a specific reason, for a specific circumstance, to address a specific problem. He's, Paul is trying to correct an error that he sees there. And so we need to be mindful of that context. This has been called task theology, T-A-S-K, task theology. This notion of writing a letter to accomplish a particular task. The reason that I that now I've changed my view, that I actually like these occasional letters, and I think they're extremely interesting and engaging, because God wants us to be immersed in the story. He wants us to actually try to put ourselves into the shoes, into the sandals, if you will, of the people living in Rome in AD 57 and try to understand how did they process this? How did they think about this? How, how do they, how would they have read this? God wants us to be immersed in a story. Story is very important. You know, one of the, the tremendous, I would say, deficiencies that we have failed to, to fully appreciate is how important stories are in our own lives. You know, all of us, every single person in this room, you have a story that's running through your mind. And maybe the story is, I'm the son of an engineer, or I'm the son of a doctor, and I'm going to be a great doctor one day, and I'm going to make a career there, or I'm going to move to this city, or I'm going to move to that country, and I'm going to have this kind of life there, or I'm going to, there's all these stories that are moving through our, our minds. And the story that is in your mind generates an identity. So if you are playing in your mind the story, I'm a great doctor, or I'm going to be a great scientist, or I'm going to be a great nurse, or whatever it is, most likely that story that's playing in your mind will generate an identity in you. You will start to see yourself as, oh, I'm going to be a, a great doctor, or a great scientist, or a great mathematician, or a great professor. And from that identity will flow beliefs, from those beliefs will flow values, from those values will, will flow actions. Now so often what happens is that people will see actions and they'll think, what's wrong with you? Just do differently. Just change, change what you do. And they don't realize that actually the way to properly correct that is to go back much deeper into a person's life and ask the question, what is the story in your heart? And if you can change the story, then you can change the identity. If you can change the identity, then you change the beliefs. If you change the beliefs, then you change the values. If you can change the beliefs, you can change the actions. So often we're, we're messing around on these superficial levels. And people are frustrated because they don't see the kind of transformation that they want because they haven't actually touched the story. I remember when I was young, I used to read the Psalms and just as part of our family devotions. And whenever the Psalm would mention something about Jacob or Abraham or something like that, I didn't like it as much. There was something about that that made it, to me, less, less exciting. I just like all those psalms with those specific names in them, they just didn't feel like they were for me. And I used to say, like, oh, I just, I'm not going to memorize those verses, or those aren't very exciting to me. Now I have the exact opposite perspective. When I read a psalm and it has a name in it, I get so excited because I think that's my spiritual ancestor. When I see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those stories, I think that's my story. I'm one of them. I'm in that, that long story of the people of God that began way back at the time of Abraham and begins until now. And so in Romans, we are challenged to put ourselves into this story. This is... This is very, very important. Now, I'm just going to leave you with one final thought here. We're going to spend more time talking about this next time. We're actually probably only going to cover one verse next time. 
because there's so much in this, these opening verses of Romans. But I just want to leave you with one thought. So did you notice how Paul opens up the letter? He gives us a clue about his identity. He gives us a very powerful sentence that explains how he thinks of himself. So Romans chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. But let's just look at that first phrase. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In Greek, Pavlos doulos Jesu Christu. Notice what he says there. He could have said, Paul, student of Gamaliel. He could have said, Paul, learned rabbi. He could have said, Paul, master theologian. He could have said, Paul, scholar of the Old Testament. Paul, gifted linguist. But instead, what does he do? He says, no, Paul, bondservant, slave, if you will. He called himself a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ. We're going to understand in the coming weeks, in the coming months, how Paul perceived himself, how he derived this identity of himself and of the Christian community. There's a very powerful idea in this. And how do you introduce yourself? You know, do you, do you say, my name is Finney, I'm a, I'm a doctor, or I work as a teacher, or I'm a scientist, or this or that, whatever your identity is. Or do you introduce yourself with, my name is, is Finney, and I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ.